Hey, welcome to this video on Rust primitives. My name is Doug Milford from Lambda Valley. Rust has similar primitive types that other programming languages do. However, how variables are managed in Rust quickly veers off the beaten path. So it's important you understand the Rust way of doing things. I'll start with the easiest primitive type, which is a Boolean or a bool. For those of you who don't have a background in programming, all it means is a variable that holds a true or a false. So let's break that down a little bit. To declare a variable, we use the let keyword to tell Rust that we want to create a new variable. We can call the variable whatever we like. At the end of the variable declaration, we have to give it a value, which I've set to true, and then finish it off with a semicolon. The convention is to use snake case for the name which means all lowercase words separated by an underscore. If I don't follow that convention, it will give a warning. You can override that warning if you like. I've added different warning overrides at the top of this file so that I don't constantly get warnings about unused variables and such. I don't do that in production environment because those warnings are useful, but I'm doing it in the videos. It's annoying to constantly have those warning messages appear. Anyways, let's add one that overrides the snake case just to show you how it's done. Unless you have a very good reason not to, I recommend you stick with the expected snake case convention. It just makes it easier for other Rust developers who are reading your code. That goes for other warnings I've overwritten for the purposes of this video. I don't recommend you doing that in the production environment unless you absolutely have to. Note, the compiler is pretty good at figuring out what your data type is, even if you don't explicitly define it. If I just set my data to true or false, it knows that it's a type Boolean. Hey, what else could it be, right? I guess it saves you a few keystrokes. If you hover your mouse over the variable, it'll tell you what type it is, even if you haven't explicitly defined it. I want to talk about immutability for a bit, meaning whether your variable can be changed or not. When a variable can be changed, it's called mutable. When it can't, it's called immutable. Rust, by default, assumes things are immutable, and so far in this video, I've been creating immutable variables that cannot change. So if I try to change my variable, it'll give a compile error. This is a safety feature which comes into play down the road and may not be readily apparent why this is useful at this point. However, if you want your variable to be mutable, all you need to do is put MUT in front of it. And now we can modify it to our heart's content. Okay, so that's bool. The next is integer, or int for short. They represent positive and negative whole numbers. Now, there's multiple flavors of integers depending on how large a number you expect to hold and whether or not you need to have negative values. So the first guy we'll talk about is i8, where the i stands for integer and the 8 stands for 8 bits of memory. What that means is it has enough memory to store 256 possible whole numbers, or 2 to the 8th power, which is where the 8 in the i8 comes from. Now, since the integer has to handle both positive and negative numbers, it splits the 256 into two halves and applies the first half to represent negative numbers, and the other half for positive numbers including covering zero. So it can effectively cover the range of whole numbers from negative 128 to positive 127. If I try to place a number inside of the variable that's outside of that range, I'll get a compile error. Hovering your mouse over the error will give you more information. And if you're one of those odd ducks that likes to see the actual formula, here it is. The max and the min values are available as constants in the standard type definition if you find that useful. It'll give you the same values as the formula. So let's go ahead and print those out. Let's pause for a moment to discuss a very important issue that can bite you in programming. Even though I got a compile error when I tried to place a number too large into the variable, all situations are not so easily caught. Here, I'm adding 120 to our initial value of 10, and this gives us 130. The compiler doesn't seem to catch that, and is an issue even though it's greater than the variable can hold. If I run this program in debug mode, it will panic when it reaches that line of code, meaning it'll crash the program. 
That's good because the faster you hit issues and fix them, the sooner your end user will never have to worry about them. When it panics, it will tell you why, and in this case, it's due to an attempted overflow, meaning we're trying to shove a value into a variable that it's not capable of holding. In release mode though, what it does is wrap around to the back end of the possible values. So we see negative 126 being printed out here, which is obviously wrong. So debug mode and release mode treat things differently. It bothers me that Rust treats it differently depending on which mode, but I kind of understand their reasoning. Rust catches many memory issues, but in this situation it won't, and I am not sure what's worse. A program that can crash unexpectedly, or one that silently creates bad data? If this was your bank account, would you rather it crashed before the transaction was completed, or went ahead and created wrong data? I guess it depends on whether it's a positive or a negative, right? This situation is neither unique to Rust, nor specific to I8. I'm just picking on the I8 type to illustrate. The important thing is that you have to be very clear in programming about what data type you're using and whether it's capable of holding all possible values it can come across. Again, this is in all programming languages that I know of, not just Rust, but I want to make sure you're aware of the potential issue. If there's going to be any question whether your data will have an issue, just choose a larger size. It's not worth crashing over. Moving on, the I8 splits the 256 possible values into positive and negative values. But in situations where you don't have to worry about negative values, you can use every bit of that 256 range to represent only positive numbers, including zero using the U8. The U stands for unsigned int, which is also eight bits. The range for that is zero to 255. You may think it should go up to 256, but remember, it needs to also cover the values of zero, so really it can only go up to 255. Note that unsigned integers can catch basic errors like trying to put in negative values into it. But, just like the I8, it can easily be tricked into overflow situations. Just be careful. The U8 is used more often than you might suspect. For example, when defining a color, you often specify a red, green, and blue value ranging from 0 to 255 each. Since you can't have negative color values, the unsigned int makes perfect sense. With just this little bit of information, there's literally over 16 million colors that can be defined by the three U8s, which is very little memory. If you need larger values to be stored, for both the I and the U integer types, you can have 16 bits, 32 bits, 64 bits, and 128 bits. Just put an I or a U and the number of bits you want, and you've got your type. For 128, which is the largest signed integer, the range is so big that you can count 12 commas before you reach the limit. To put that in perspective, a billion is reached in four commas. So I-128 is extremely large. Let's go ahead and print that out so that you can see just how large it is. Most often you'll be using an I-32 or I-64 though. I-32 is approximately plus or minus two billion. And I-64 is pretty ridiculously large, which will be big enough for a vast majority of your needs. Just make sure you choose the size you need. You can always look up the exact sizes if there's any question. If you don't specify your integer type, it will assume I32. Again, that's about plus or minus 2 billion. For many cases, that's fine. If you're trying to store the national debt, though, it will need to be defined as an I64 or a U64 if the national debt can never be negative. Some computers are 32 bit based and some are 64 bit based. If you need to create an integer, Based on the computer's architecture, you can choose an I size or a U size to represent that. Integers are fine and all, but often we'll need to represent data with decimals. In comes the float. This type represents data with floating point decimal. 
we have less options on this one. We can have either an F32 or an F64, chocolate or vanilla. The difference between those two is what precision can be held. There's a large amount of resources on the internet discussing the inner workings of a float that I won't get into in this video. It's sufficient to understand that you can't hold infinite decimal places and it's not a perfect representation of all numbers. For example, the trigonometry value of pi can't be accurately stored. If this is not familiar to you, I recommend you search for resources discussing floats as it's a much bigger topic than this video can cover. When creating your variable, the way you tell the system the number you're giving it is a float is to put a decimal point somewhere within it, even if it's on the last part. You can put more digits after if you like, but the decimal point must be present or you'll get a compile error even if you've explicitly defined the variable as a float. It'll think you're trying to shove an integer into a floating point variable. The system will assume F64 if you don't specify. Once again, you can hover your mouse over the variable to get the actual type the system thinks it is. Rust also has a primitive type for cars, or chars if you prefer to say it that way. I don't mean car as in Toyota, I mean C-H-A-R, which is shorthand for character. Some people say it like car because it's shorthand for the word character, and some people say char because that's how it's spelled. I found people know what you're talking about either way, so don't really worry too much about it. In any case, it stands for a single character and is defined with single quotes. It's four bytes, which seems like a lot for a single character, but it can represent a whole lot more than basic ASCII, even emojis. When you need to deal with foreign languages such as Chinese, having a single way to deal with cars is nice. Don't confuse car with string. In the very next video, we'll be doing strings, and it's a bit of a tricky topic in Rust. Cars are surrounded by single quotes, not double quotes. It's a subtle but important difference, so make sure you know it. Again, we'll be doing a much deeper dive into strings and cars in the next video. You may have noticed we didn't cover certain types you may have expected. As mentioned, we'll be dealing with strings shortly, but we also didn't cover date times and decimals, and when I say decimals, I don't mean floats. Neither date times nor decimals are primitive types in Rust. You can, however, import crates for either of those. Both are non-trivial data types to deal with, so part of me is sad that there doesn't seem to be a built-in primitive for those because it'd be nice to standardize. But on the other hand, part of me is glad because it gives me some flexibility and capability where other frameworks shoehorn you into a solution that doesn't always fit. I guess I just can't make up my mind. How you deal with the date times and decimals is actually up to you, and you can choose the crate that best fits your needs. To sum up, we talked about bools, which can be true or false. We talked about integers, which can be signed of I8, I16, I32, I64, or I128, or unsigned of pretty much the same values, except for U in front. We've seen that you can do architecturally dependent variables with I size and U size and it'll default to I32 if you don't actually put a type definition on it. And again, that's around plus or minus two billion. For floats, we saw that we have an F32 and F64, and that will default to F64 if you don't specify. Cars are four bits, and it can handle many different languages such as Chinese or even emojis. And always make sure your variable type is large enough to handle your data. I want to stress that because that's very important. That's one of the large issues in programming is data overflow. Thank you for watching this video on primitives. Once again, my name is Doug Milford from Land Valley, and I'll see you next time.